Um, so just a reminder that um, if you've joined as a participant, as an attendee, your audio and video aren't on. Um, so don't worry if you've got background noise, we can't hear you. Um, that really just helps um, make things a bit smooth, smoother for the, for the panellists, um, but please don't worry, um, you are muted automatically. You'll see at the bottom of the screen, there's a Q&A function and we really encourage you to, to share any questions you have for our, our panellists using that Q&A. We may, we'll be able to respond to some of them during the presentations, but we will have half an hour for, for discussion. So it'd be great to hear from you if there are any questions you'd like to ask. And just a reminder that the session is being recorded um, and we'll share that um, afterwards. Um, so thank you very much and um, feel free to share that with colleagues um, after the webinar. Um, also, the webinar is um, closed captioning is available in English um, and if you'd like to access that you can see that at the bottom of your screen as well. And then just lastly, just a reminder that the recording and presentations will be shared afterwards on the INE website and you can find all of INE's COVID-19 related resources and materials as well on that on that website. Um, but we're a couple of minutes past the hour here and we have some great speakers today so I don't want us to, to wait too much longer. Um, so Alana if you could move us to the next slide. I'll just sort of officially welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, this is part of a, a series of webinars that we're doing here at at INEE focused on um, supporting education in emergencies during COVID-19. You can find all of those recordings from other webinars on topics such as inclusive education or teacher support, distance education on the INEE website and we'll certainly be sharing this, these resources there as well. You can also find other COVID-19 related materials. Um, and the goal of this series is really to bring people together um, in these challenging times and um, to share practical examples and experiences um, with each other as an education and emergencies community. Um, but let's focus on today. Today our focus is education and learning for youth and adolescents during COVID-19. We know this is a really important topic um, for many of you. Um, we've heard that loudly from our members um, here at INEE and we're really grateful to our panellists today um, for coming together to share their experiences and resources um, about this topic. We know that young people often aren't prioritised in humanitarian response in the way they should be and we know that during the, this global pandemic, pandemic more than ever we need to be making sure that education and learning continues but also that we empower young people, that we really um, listen to their voices and empower them as, as leaders. Um, and I'm really excited that that will be a key theme and a key focus um, for us today. Sadly, my director, Dean Brooks, isn't able to join us. He was very sorry not to be here, but I know he's going to be listening to the recording. But he wanted me to pass on his thanks to all of you for joining us today, panellists and um, attendees, um, and to thank you for everything, everything you're doing at these times. But as I said, we've got a packed agenda. Let's take a quick look. Next slide, please, Alana, just to give you a sense of what we'll be discussing today. So we're first going to hear some sort of framing and orientation for us today around the key considerations for, for young people generally and specifically during COVID-19. So we'll be hearing from Paul Fien from NRC and Basim Nasir at UNICEF HQ. We'll then hear for first-hand personal experiences. Really excited um, to have Babakar Sangeta from UN Major Group for Children and Youth with us and Salyu Timbo, I hope I'm saying that right, Timbo, from Restless Development um, to speak about their experiences. And last but not least, we'll hear some um, two very contrasting important case, country case studies. We'll hear from Bethana Kumar from UNFPA Jordan and Sarah Al Halawani, I hope I said that right as well, from Relief International about the work they're doing in Jordan with the, um, the youth task force there. And we'll be hearing from Tisiana Garcia Tapia um, from UNICEF Indonesia about the work they're doing with the ministry in Indonesia. So hopefully a, a great uh, mix of presentations today and then we'll close with a, a moderated discussion where we'd love to hear your questions. So please do share those at any time. But I don't want to eat into our precious time together. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Paul and Bassam to, to start us off with some framing for this important, important topic. Thanks everyone. Over to you, Paul. Great, thank you very much for the introduction, Charlotte, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. I'd like to start today's session by putting young people at the centre for us to start to reflect on the capacities and needs that young people have. Um, so I invite you to join me in a very simple, reflective exercise. Um, personal to you, just to start the webinar by thinking about somebody that you know who's a young person, so maybe in their teens or 20s, 
perhaps a participant in a project you work on, maybe youth in the community where you work. And I would like you to think about these three questions just as reflections. So first of all, what are their interests and their ambitions? What are the opportunities and barriers that affect whether and how they can achieve these ambitions? And thirdly, how has COVID-19 impacted on these young people? So the goal here is that for us to be empathetic and to start to think about what are the different opportunities and challenges that young people face um, in these different contexts where you all, where you all work. So um, you can reflect on this person and these questions from now as you listen to the presentations today, and then we'll come back to this uh, when we wrap up and move into the discussion as well. So let's start on the next slide by thinking about who are uh, the young people we're talking about today. And I don't want to start by giving you a age category because I feel that's quite reductive and it masks the assets and the needs that young people have. So conceptually, um, I find this quote from UNESCO very helpful in capturing the central characteristics of adolescence and youth. So as the quote says, youth is best understood as a period of transition from the dependence of childhood to adulthood's independence and awareness of our interdependence as members of a community. Youth is a more fluid category than an age group. So we know that adolescents and youth go through a process of physiological and psychological changes and transition, for example, in terms of developing a greater sense of identity and their sense of values, transition from education to employment, transition from being a member of a family to starting a family, getting married, raising children. There are many, many examples of this process of transition. Um, we, and that's a key aspect for us to think about today. But if I go on to the next slide, now I said I don't want to start with age brackets, but I think we do need to have some defining terms, so some common understanding of who we are talking about. So age definitions vary by country and by institutions, but for statistical consistency, we have these definitions used by UNICEF and other UN agencies and other agencies, um, which show younger adolescents being from the age of 10 to 14, so a, uh, so a period of puberty and identity formation. From 15 to 19 is later adolescence, where young people develop skills and knowledge and networks to engage in broader society. And then we have young adulthood from the age of 20 to 24, so a process of uh, becoming mature and adopting adult roles. So in today's, um, in today's discussion, we're talking broadly about adolescence and youth, so young people between the ages of 10 to 24. But that brings me to my next question, and next slide, why focus on adolescence and youth in emergencies? So I've talked about this process of transition for young people, and emergencies and humanitarian contexts disrupt this process of transition. So uh, in an emergency context, for example, young people take on more adult responsibilities, such as earning an income, being a caregiver to others, making important decisions in challenging situations. Um, young people in emergencies, they lack opportunities to develop, such as through education, social services, and others. And by being displaced and separated from friends and families, they've lost that social support network that they once had. Young people are also at increased risk of violence and gender-based violence, more likely to be involved in crimes, to be involved in armed groups. And this is an issue for young people themselves, but, the, but also it impacts on their families and their children in the future, creating an intergenerational uh, cycle of poverty and inequity. But if we recognize these clear needs of young people, unfortunately, the humanitarian um, setting is not really set up to address these needs. I mean, young people uh, have funding for youth services, receive insufficient resources, and there's no clear home for young people within the humanitarian system. You know, different youth needs are addressed by different sector responses, whether it's education, protection, livelihoods, without having a holistic response to supporting young people. And finally, 
Um, young people themselves, they have roles in humanitarian response and supporting others, as we're going to see in today's, uh, in the many examples we have in today's session. So the question for us is really how do we as humanitarians ensure that we address the needs of young people while also supporting them to be change makers in their community. So if I move on to the next slide, one of the responses to this was the Compact for Young People in Humanitarian Action, which is an interagency initiative. And UNICEF and NRC co-led the development of guidelines for the Youth Compact for Young People in Humanitarian Action, which is really a practical guide for different sectors to address the needs of young people. And if I just, we have on the slide there the different steps of the hum, uh, humanitarian program cycle and some tips for each of, the aspect, each of the steps within education. But just to highlight too, in strategic planning, um, we as agencies should use the humanitarian response plan process to address the needs of young people. And we can also engage young people in, um, in education planning committees. And in number three, for example, resource mobilization, um, we should gather and disseminate key information about the education needs and opportunities for young people. And as a tip for young people's participation on the right hand side, partner with young people to develop key advocacy messages for education funding. So I just wanted to highlight that these guidelines are, are currently being finalized and will be available later this year. And uh, you can go into it in much more detail for the education sector, but also for other sectors as well. But if I move on to the next slide, please. But in the shorter term, the Compact for Young People in Humanitarian Action has also developed guidance on working with young people for COVID-19. And our goal here was to ensure that we address the age and gender and disability inclusive services for adolescents and youth in the context of COVID-19. So um, as we saw in the previous slide, there are some priority actions for us to consider. And these include uh, engaging young people in education sector risk assessments, contingency plans and response plans. So we know we're addressing the needs of young people we've identified. But also I'm sure we're gonna talk a lot today about um, adapting education provision to, um, to during COVID-19. And to do this, we need to consider how to be accessible in these adaptive modalities in terms of language, having formats available for uh, young people with disabilities. How do we help young people access social and emotional learning across age groups? And if we do consider new methods such as remote learning, remote coaching and mentoring, we should uncover content, including life skills, sexuality education or reproductive health, as well as other theoretical learning. And finally, in terms of protection, if we are going to have increased services delivered online uh, through online learning, then for protection, we need to consider training of young people and trainers on being safe online. And I'll come back to you in the conclusion, but for now, I'll hand over to my colleague Bassam uh, with UNICEF uh, to take us forward. Thank you, Paul. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, dear colleagues. Uh, my name is Bassem Nasser. I work at UNICEF headquarters within the education team leading the work on skills. This is a great opportunity for me to highlight how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted an already dire situation uh, regarding the learning of adolescents, especially the most vulnerable and marginalized, and some of the strategies that many of our country offices have been implementing and advocating for with governments and other partners, and that I hope many of you and your organizations will support. So to begin with, I will start with two stark figures that reflect the challenge that we see. Prior to COVID-19, of the 1.5 billion school age children in low and middle income countries, well over half, about 870 million, will not, will not have been on track to acquire the minimum level of secondary skills by 2030. As COVID hit us and disrupted learning for more than 1.5 billion children and adolescents in 192 countries, we found out that 520 of those were uh, in lower and upper secondary school levels, including 251 million young girls, in addition to 200 million out of school uh, uh, children and adolescents. Next, please. So with that in mind, 
at UNICEF, our education strategy, uh, which is entitled Every Child Learns, strives to ensure that all adolescents in or out of school develop the knowledge and skills for learning, personal empowerment, employability, and civic engagement. So in brief, to do so, we believe that all adolescents will need to build four main types of skills that are interconnected, which are the foundational skills of literacy and numeracy, the transferable skills or the life skills or the social emotional learning. And more increasingly, we are finding the need for more digital skills. And for older adolescents uh, who are transitioning to the world of work, job specific skills are, are important for them to acquire. The, this is sort of the, the what uh, in terms of the learning. The how and to ensure equity, and this, is, this need has been highlighted by COVID-19, we believe that there should be multiple pathways to ensure learning, whether through formal education systems, non-formal education systems, but there are also valuable learning and skills development opportunities throughout other pathways that ensure equity and mitigate against interruption of learning. These pathways include uh, things that, that Paul just mentioned, uh, uh, girl empowerment programs, comprehensive sexuality education, adolescent participation programs, child protection programs, nutrition and health. All great pathways and opportunities for young people to learn and develop the skills. Next, please. So with that background in mind, COVID-19 has struck and created more challenges in terms of the uh, continuity of access and learning to young people. So UNICEF has been working with governments and partners in almost all the countries we work in. So in this slide, I'd like to share with you some of the challenges and opportunities highlighted by colleagues from the field. These are by no means comprehensive, but highlight the challenges and hopefully give us a little bit of hope in terms of what could be coming next. So in terms of the challenges, uh, needless to say, countries are noticing worsened situations in terms of the situation of youth, including higher dropout rates, loss of learning, increases in violence, mental health, and unemployment. There's also challenges in a lot of the distant learning modalities that have uh, uh, emerged very quickly in terms of the, the response of the countries. One of the key challenges is they are missing the skills uh, component in terms of developing skills, life skills, social emotional learning, and are mostly focused on academic knowledge. So there's a huge missed opportunity within that context. And even within those uh, uh, modalities, we have found that teachers aren't prepared uh, uh, to, to deliver through these distance learning modalities. And actually, we have very little information beyond access in terms of whether these children or adolescents are actually learning. Across both these two challenges, we find a huge equity uh, uh, challenge in the situation of learning of uh, the vulnerable and most marginalized adolescents. And this actually has been made worse uh, within the COVID crisis. But our colleagues, as, as all development practitioners, have also observed some opportunities that can give us some hope into working better to address this crisis. So some of them are that there are great models emerging in adolescents participating meaningfully in their own learning. We are also finding governments and partners open to expand formal education to more alternative learning approaches and also involving multi-sectoral approaches with uh, uh, through other partners and other ministries such as ministries of labor, technologies or youth, as well as civil society organizations. And related to that, and in many countries, we have seen the private sector stepping up and be ready to participate and engage very meaningfully, whether through providing learning materials, supporting uh, digital learning, connectivity, or actually financing some of those uh, programs. Next. As such, and my final slide, we'll be sharing with you uh, our context-based strategy. So some of the key pillars into the what of learning, into our, our uh, context-based strategy, is that it should be skills-based. The teachers should be prepared to deliver uh, uh, regardless of, of the, where we are in the context, and that assessment must be implemented. Within the context of COVID, MHPSS has become of additional importance and highlighted as a huge need by countries, as a key component of well-being of adolescents and an enabler of learning. Programmatically, some of the principles that we uh, aim to deliver on, uh, on are the focus on equity, intersectoral approaches, including adolescents as meaningful participants in their own learning and implementing an all hands on deck uh, 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 approach with, uh, 
through education and other sectors. We have defined three main phases. Uh, on one of the links shared earlier, you will be able to get more details on those phases. But for now, and to help us move on, I will share some of the key strategies for each of the phases. So the first phase is during school closure. So dur during school closure, we are looking at supporting the continuity of secondary education through the delivery of distance uh, and secondary education through the various modalities that you can see on the slide. During the recovery and reopening, you will see three strategies. From my perspective, they're all important, but one is to keep in mind is the development of multiple alternative learning pathways, such as catch-up, remedial, and accelerated uh, education, and their recognition, certification, and validation. This is becoming very, very important. The third phase, which uh, very, very few countries uh, are in, but which we hope we will get to very soon, is the opening up better. And, and many of us are imagining how can we take advantage of this crisis to really rethink and reimagine of a skills-based education and learning for adolescents uh, in terms of the content and the delivery, including innovative approaches, multiple pathways, and IT-enabled learning. So with that in mind, I really want to thank you for your presence once again. I look forward to engaging in the Q&A and hearing from other colleagues on their own experiences. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Bassam and Paul. I think a really helpful and important framing for us today as we continue this discussion. Um, and I'm really excited now to be handing over um, to Bubakar Singhata, who joins us from the uh, UN Major Group for Children and Youth. And Bubakar is a young humanitarian from the Gambia. I'm really excited to, to have him with us today um, and to hear about his experience. So Bubakar, can I um, invite you to, to put your video back on and, and to, to speak to us about your experiences today? Oh, yes. Hi, Charlotte. I hope um, you're able to see my video. And my audio to, uh, so apologies in advance because I'm in a distribution center and then there might be a lot of background noise coming in. So my apologies. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Bubakar for representing the children and youth major group. Um, to the next slide. So, um, Basically, before I delve into my presentation, I'll just want to share a little bit of the background about um, UN Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, UN Major Group for Children and Youth is UN General Assembly mandated space, self-organized space for children and youth to engage in intergovernmental policy processes at the UN level. And then um, in terms of uh, engagement, we act as a bridge between young people and the UN system in order to ensure that young people are meaningfully participating in, in decision making or on issues that affects their life. So also um, the UN major group was um, created by the Agenda 21 in 1992 and then additionally received its strengths and mandates through the General Assembly, several General Assembly resolutions and bilateral agreements. All right, um, to the next slide. Good. So, Generally, also the work of um, UN Major Group is clustered within these six main thematic areas in resilience and humanitarian action, in human rights, in peace building and security, in youth policy and development, sustainable development and governance. Because um, our role as young people is to, as UN Major Group, is to ensure that young people are meaningfully engaged in terms of policy issues in each of these sectors. So this is what we do, and then this is what we do. We do it right from the global level to the national level. For instance, at the global level, we have the major group. At the regional level, we have representatives as regional focal points in, in, in all the eight regions of um, the UN. And also nationally as well, we have our national consortiums or national level representatives from comprising of different youth groups and organizations. So basically, MDCY serves as a platform for young people to be meaningfully engaged in terms of um, issues or intergovernmental um, discussions uh, at the UN level. Next slide. Again, um, I think for me, this is the most um, beautiful part, sharing my personal experience in terms of um, youth COVID and education. Um, for me, education 
does not always mean you have to sit in the classroom and be taught by someone, for instance, a teacher or a lecturer, but instead um, it needs to be more informal where, you know, known formal as well, where people who do not have access to sit in the classroom are able to learn something. And this can be provided to, can, can be provided by the society, by the people that you interact with. And then personally, from my own personal experience, not all what I know were learned from the classroom, no. I've learned so much more than what I knew from the classroom. As a volunteer, in my, in my 21 years of volunteering experience, I've learned so much with the Red Cross, engaging with other young people, engaging with other organizations, both locally and globally. And I think these have contributed uh, quite a lot in, in, in my life and as well in terms of my career part. And then, next, next slide, sorry. Again, in terms of um, skills, the skills that I learned um, from volunteering are actually um, things that I'm making best use of to transition from my you know, youth pattern to my professional career. For instance, now I work with the Gambia National Youth Council as a regional youth program officer on migration information. So looking at my skills that I earned from the Red Cross in terms of my engagement around my youth and migration issues, my skills that I've learned from UNMGCY interacting with my co-peers, you know, are some of these skills that I'm using in my day-to-day -day working environment to ensure that, you know, I push up the agenda of young people in terms of migration issues. So some of the practical skills that I was able to get in terms of my volunteering, in, in my volunteering career, ranges from communication and advocacy skills, community engagement issues, um, practical youth skills, practical skills in, in youth and community development. Of course, now I'm currently serving as um, an interim chair for, for Sukra Youth Committee. Like my, my own community, we had a platform where young people you know, are coordinated in a way they can meaningfully engage in decision making within the community level. So this as well, I've, um, I've learned and then I'm utilizing these skills in that capacity as well. And then in terms of youth engagement to within the IFRC's humanitarian education um, initiatives that up with, I've also learned about humanitarian principles and values. And this have, has helped me a lot as an individual, as a volunteer to be able to, you know, develop the necessary skills and competence to, you know, address issues that are of concern to me and to my society as well. So most of what I do in my work, professional work, we are not taught to me in, in the classroom as well. So in simple term, volunteering has you know, really shaped my life and I'm who I am because of my many years of volunteering service as a young humanitarian. Next slide. So I'm going to some of the concrete examples um, that we have as young people or UN Major Group for Children and Youth is um, in terms of um, health promotion and education, young people are doing quite a lot to ensure that the society, the community, and the people, you know, become aware of the dangers, the risks, and health, you know, consequences surrounding them, and as well be able to take up the the, the necessary actions to to prevent some of those um, health hazards becoming a disaster or some a burden on them. So this, for instance, um, we, in Sukuta, in my community, we formed the COVID-free Sukuta Tax Force, which I was actually leading as a young person. This was the initi initiative of young people. And then together with the support of our village development committee, we were able to do a lot. And also in terms of surveillance, young people are more engaged in surveillance by generating Google Plus codes and ensuring that, you know, we, re we, we coordinate this with the Minister of Health to ensure that we report on issues that people who are intruding within the borders because currently we're having border closures and then young people are doing all this surveillance to ensure that the, our communities become free from um, the, the COVID cases. In terms of risk communication and community engagement as well, we've had so many rigorous awareness raising access, um, activities in, in our communities at that UN major group level. You know, I, many of these young people or youth 
platforms have actually conducted several activities to ensure that you know young people are meaningfully engaged in terms of raising awareness and then ensuring that the risks and dangers are communicated to the people. So in terms of tackling the rumors and the myths, you know, young people are producing, you know, videos, short skits to counter, you know, the, some of these um, misinformations that are going around about um, the COVID. For instance, in my country, now if you talk to people about COVID, what they are going to tell you is, have you seen anyone with this COVID? No. But again, you know, it becomes more of like a myth for them to say, I'm a black person and then, you know, here we, our temperature is like between 30 to 35, 38 degrees. So if I cannot really contract COVID. If I have COVID because of the hot temperature, it will go away. So these are some of the myths that are actually, that are actually going around within my community. And then we're doing everything possible to ensure that we you know, counter some of these myths because it's actually going to pose a lot of threat and danger to, to the lives of the population if um, the health regulations are not adhered to. So more of this um, information can be found from the link below on GNMGCY website on what young people are doing in terms of COVID. Next. So going to my key message, as a young person, we want you to engage us right from the beginning. That is right from the planning and the design stage to the implementation, to the follow up and review processes of all the actions that you do. Because um, we can only deliver best when we are involved more meaningfully from the beginning. If you want to entrust the future to us, for us, we humbly ask you to engage us more meaningfully from now. So this is the key message that I'm sending across to ensure that all actors engaging young people do not only see young people as mere you know, companions, but we are actually important partners to ensure that whatever you do today, whatever we do today, actually translates to ensuring that we have a sustainable future for all. So I think um, that's the end of my slide. Charlotte? Thank you so much, Babaka. Really powerful to hear about your, your own experience as a volunteer and, and then the um, incredible work you're doing now. Um, so thank you. And we'll definitely keep that message with us, I'm sure. Um, so thank you so much. Um, and I appreciate you joining us at a very busy time. If you can stay with us on the webinar, we'd love to have you with us for the Q&A, as I know our uh, participants would love to ask some questions. Second, um, I'll, I'll stay with you. Huh? Great. Thank you so much, Babaka. Fantastic. Um, so let's hear from another another brilliant youth youth advocate and um, who's joining us today, Timbo. If you're able to to turn on your your video and, and unmute your mic, it'd be great to hear about the work that that you've done in the past and that you're doing at the moment um, to help young people. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. So they said um, the host has stopped my video. So maybe if you can turn it on. Yes, let's have I'll a look. Try to. There we go, try now. Perfect. All right. Thanks, Timbo. Um, good afternoon, everybody from Sierra Leone. And my, my name is Saliu Timbo. I work for Restless Development as the leadership program manager. I am implementing the Every Adolescent Girls Empowered and Resilience Program here in Sierra Leone. I actually want to share my experience, um, especially with regards to emergency issues in Sierra Leone, especially that has to do with the health. In Sierra Leone, we have experienced two um, health emergency. One is the Ebola outbreak and the current COVID-19 that we are. My personal experience when we have health emergency issues, one is young people or people in Sierra Leone don't actually trust the health system. We have difficulties in reaching out to people with information, very low compliance from community people. And then the different, different messages that are actually coming from different partners, even the, the, the government itself. And um, people don't pay attention to um, social media houses like the radio station, the television station, where they can have access to information. So these are my personal experience I have whenever we have um, emergency in Sierra Leone, especially with this COVID-19. 
one of the issues that are actually disturbing us is uh, the politics and fighting the COVID-19. But um, as an organization, Restless Development, or me personally, um, there are a few approach we have, have learned and have experienced in implementing to community people and engaging young people in Sierra Leone. One is the focusing on the machine, uh, young people. You know, for whatever, for any time we have issues, um, emergency issues in Sierra Leone, um, young people are the go-to when it comes to responding to emergency issues in this country. Young people are actually participating, participating in um, responding to health issues. Example, during the Ebola outbreak, the young people are bleeding on the burial team. Young people are surveillance. Um, they are part of the surveillance team. They are also part of the contact tracing team. So whenever we have emergency issues, be it health or disaster in Sierra Leone, these young people are the first people to actually take the lead, go out to the community, do a door-to-door -door sensitization, educating people about the issues on prevention and transmission. That's another approach I've learned. Another thing again is the um, community-led emergency approach. This is an approach that was introduced during the Ebola um, outbreak in Sierra Leone. And this approach, we are still using it during this um, COVID-19 situation. This community-led emergency approach, these are community stakeholders. They actually meet with the support of young people, engage in the community, come up with so many measures to prevent their community, to protect their community, and to um, serve as a surveillance team for people that are coming into their community and out of their community. When we have um, emergency issues in this country, um, as an organization, we believe in young people. And we know that young people believe in young people. Adolescents believe in adolescents. So what we did was to actually recruit over 500 young people to go to various community, especially vulnerable community, where they find it very difficult to get information, and they go to those community, provide health talks at the health center. And we have lots of issues with the gas um, myth, perception, misperception on issues of um, emergency in this country, especially with regards to this current COVID-19. People still don't believe that COVID-19 is real in Sierra Leone. So, but what we have done so far is to in introduce the survival testimonial approach. This survival testimonial approach is for Ebola outbreak, we do have Ebola survivors. Yeah, even this COVID-19, we do have COVID-19 survivors. So we organize events in the community where we celebrate those people that have uh, survived from the, the virus. And when they come to the community, we welcome them. We give them an opportunity where they can actually share their experience, how they come in contact with the virus, what are some of the learnings they actually got to other young people in the community in the form of education. We also have a youth report system where we send messages to young people that these young people are actually responding to these message, messages. A youth report is a kind of a platform where um, it's been added by UNICEF. Western Development was actually implementing that youth report system, sending out messages to young people and young people respond. And the intergenerational dialogue approach is to bridge the gap between the cold and young people to see how best they can um, address their challenges amicably in the community. Next, please. Next, please. All right. Um, in an emergency situation, one key thing, no, please, go back. In an emergency situation, one key thing that we have learned is to provide a psychological, please, a psychological first aid to young people. It is normal that young people actually, um, exactly, young people actually are stressed. They are fear, they are anger, they are frustrated when it comes to health emergency. Even at this COVID-19 situation, young people are actually not happy with the current information that is going on. But what we have done, um, the young people that we have recruited, we have identified trusted people in those communities that we have trained on how to provide psychological first aid to other young people that are frustrated, other young people that are actually um, not happy with what is happening, right? So, and with the current situation. So we give them the necessary training 
in those various community and with the focus on the principles of psychological first aid to actually see how best they can introduce the, the principle which is to look, uh, listen, and link them. Look, identify young people that are actually frustrated, what are some of the issues, allow them to talk to you, you give them a kind of necessary feedback um, that will comfort them, that will prevent them from further harm, and also link them to other services that they can go and access. Next, please. Now, I really want to share my experience on education, both the formal education and the non-formal education during the COVID-19. At the moment, government has announced that all schools should be closed. And for now, no schools are open. So what the governments have done, they have engaged teachers. I know it's actually difficult but based on the learning we took from the Ebola outbreak, I think for now, for this COVID-19, it's very simple for teachers to actually go to the radio station and do a kind of teaching program through the radio station and in the television station. But for the radio station, the focus is in the rural communities because in the rural community, they have limited access to television. So for the television program, it's focused on the bigger towns or the cities in the, like Freetown. So they actually, teachers are going to the television station, the radio station to provide um, teaching program mathematics and social study in English. So we, as an organization, we are just sensitizing young people, inform them that this, uh, there is a learning program going on in both radio station and the television station. For the non-formal education, we are, I am actually leading on the non-formal education in Sierra Leone, I really want to share an experience. One of the experience um, I will have learned and uh, introduced is the functional literacy and numeracy approach to girls, adolescent girls that have never been to school or they have dropped out from school from primary three. And the functional literacy, we identify a safe space within the community where we have a smaller group, like um, from seven to 10, we ensure social distance, we provide them with face masks, and we, we provide uh, disinfectants for all those safe spaces. We train a community facilitator. This community facilitator are actually leading literacy and numeracy session to adolescent girls in those community. And another approach that we have used in COVID-19 situation is the regenerated fire and literacy through empowering community techniques. In short, they call it reflect. It's a reflect approach. The reflex approach is a kind of approach that actually supports young people to take up leadership role in addressing issues in their community. And this approach has a two-way approach. Their particular approach is to see how best they can address, respond to emergency situation, and also they are also learning basic literacy and numeracy skills in that particular approach. So we are currently doing that. So the approach is they are there to actually address the issue of COVID-19, whilst they are also learning basic literacy and numeracy skills in this, uh, in this particular approach. Next, please. So um, in Sierra Leone, the health emergency situation comes with other issues that affect young people. And this one is sexual gender-based violence. You know, most of the times we experience violence at home, sexual violence, sexual exploitation at home. But as an organization, what we've done is to identify trusted women, give the necessary training on protection, child protection, and education. And we ask them to go to various communities to give out educational messages on sexual gender-based violence to young people in the community. We do door-to-door -door sensitization. So, and that has been addressed in the COVID-19. Finally, I want to actually leave you with a message. And this next, next slide, please. This message I want to leave you with, it's um, we have the power to solve the challenges our society faces, but our power needs to be recognized and utilized. Indeed, our power needs to be recognized and utilized. So therefore, I want to take a, 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 a call to action for all partners that they should recognize our power and have the partner with young people listen to us let our experiences and ideas inform our responses and policies to ensure education and learning at the same 
and, you, and youth during COVID-19. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Timbo. Um, yeah, we're so grateful for you joining us today. Please do stay on for the Q&A. You spoke, again, such inspiring work you're doing and you spoke about, you know, about power and energy of young people and you really brought that to us today. So thank you so much. I'm gonna quickly hand over to our country case studies now. We're going to start hearing from colleagues in, in Jordan. Um, Sarah and Bethana, over for you, to you. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Charlotte, and thank you everyone for this great uh, opportunity to present the case of Jordan. I'm very happy that our presentation came uh, uh, after all of these uh, conceptual framework, but also uh, uh, practices from the field that we actually are learning from here in Jordan in the COVID-19 response. Uh, today, myself and my colleague Sarah will uh, talk about the Youth Task Force. I'll be covering more of the this kind of coordination structure. Uh, Paul mentioned the, the whole uh, compact agenda, uh, how we are working on engaging young people in uh, the humanitarian response, but in practice, how does this look like? Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I will be uh, presenting is basically uh, details about the youth task force, how it works, what it's doing, but then also would like to uh, cover with Sarah more of the youth engagement and participation part, but also examples from uh, the feed. So shortly, as you can see from the graph, of course, in each humanitarian response, there is different structures. This uh, uh, graph shows the structure, the coordination structure in the Zaatari camp. As you can see, the youth task force falls under the education working group and the protection working group. However, uh, the way we are working as the youth task force is we have focal points at each working group in order to ensure that the youth agenda is presented in all sectors. So that's why the youth task force is an action oriented field level forum. Uh, it focuses on youth specific advocacy, planning and coordination, uh, but it's also addressing the cross cutting nature of this population. Uh, uh, group. Uh, so we feel that it provides an example of how coordination in humanitarian settings could look like. And um, of course, the members of uh, this task force is organizations working in Zaatari camp, Zaatari refugee camp for Syrian refugees, uh, that provides uh, youth programming. Uh, however, they can be from different and variety of sectors. So you will find uh, organizations that provide reproductive health, others that are providing education, others that are focusing on livelihoods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. In Jordan, uh, the Youth Task Force is chaired by UNFPA, and uh, it's co-chaired by uh, NRC. And uh, I know that Paul uh, is uh, one of the uh, uh, initial uh, uh, co-chairs uh, in uh, in Jordan. Um, so it's great to see how also the, the conceptual part is linked to, uh, uh, into the field and it feeds into uh, each other. So uh, next slide, please. So th the question is, okay, how this group is working? What does it uh, 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 do? How we are interacting? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first element, as I mentioned, is it is a coordination uh, uh, structure. So basically, um, as simple as sharing knowledge, sharing information, meeting uh, every month, conducting uh, regular updates about the youth programming. In this uh, image, you can see that uh, th this is part of a recent uh, application that uh, so was supported by uh, UNHCR and Bluemont, where the youth task force, we worked on conducting mapping with information about youth services in the camp. Mm -hmm. So yes, you see the screen is static, but in reality, uh, this is a very interactive map where you can see, okay, so in area A, uh, what kind of youth services I can find? In area B, what kind of youth mm -hmm. services and how many young people are living in this um, uh, area? If, I, if I'm interested in learning more about UNICEF uh, uh, centers or uh, um, uh, NRC centers or UNFPA centers, I can find them in the map. So uh, basically, uh, this platform is to share information. Now, when it came to COVID-19 and in Zachary camp, there are so many 
already existing restrictions, but also limited internet connectivity. So this platform was really a great uh, uh, re like, uh, resource uh, for sharing information about rapid assessments, information, different uh, practices. It can be as simple as sending emails or meetings or via WhatsApp uh, uh, groups. So this is kind of in a simplified way, uh, the coordination and sharing information uh, part. Next slide, please. Uh, so the other element is the advocacy and the knowledge management. And of course, this cannot happen without the evidence. What is the evidence? What is the information that you have? So the Youth Task Force tries to utilize on many assessments research that are uh, focusing on young people, on adolescents, and uh, develop key messages to advocate within the different working groups, but also with donors, implementing partners, and in the, at the camp. I'll give you an example. For example, in Zatari, many, uh, uh, when it came to education, uh, many platforms uh, counted on online, platform, uh, online and virtual platforms, but also TV. What we found is that not all the family members can access TV or have a, a, a phone to uh, look at the classes or the classrooms. So uh, uh, for, uh, as an example, uh, also the internet um, connection or accessibility, it's not that affordable for all uh, families. So we started to generate the discussions of what can we do, what kind of alternatives we can uh, provide. So for example, uh, UNICEF shared 8,000 data bundle. Uh, on a smaller scale, uh, scholarship programs through UNHCR and HOPE started to cover internet fees for their students, university students, um, especially when it comes to youth. And as mentioned earlier in the presentation as a transitional phase, uh, the focus uh, on education always comes to the younger age, but there is kind of exclusion for older uh, age groups. And that's what we try to uh, bring uh, also into the table. Into, in the two photos, you will see uh, uh, products uh, that also were published during the COVID-19. Uh, uh, on the right with the uh, beautiful smiling uh, girl, uh, it's more of collecting uh, what are the stories from the field under uh, COVID-19. Because young people, it's not like only been affected uh, by uh, COVID-19 in a negative way, but also they stood up and showed positive engagement when it comes to the response. So through activating WhatsApp groups, through uh, trying to help us with innovative ideas of how can we keep the engagement with young people in the camp. Uh, I would like to highlight that um, because uh, uh, we really, uh, in, in Jordan, never really, uh, at least in the last 30, 40 years or recent three years, uh, faced a pandemic in this situation. Uh, we looked up into a disc review where it, uh, actually many of the examples that Timbo mentioned, we tried to look at how countries uh, responded to Ebola. So we did this disc review if we want alternatives other than virtual and internet uh, uh, programs, what can we do? So also uh, UNFPA worked on producing the desk review uh, to help practitioners from the field to design the projects. Next slide, please. And uh, this will be the last slide from my side before I move to uh, Sarah is the capacity building. As the youth task force, of course, we provide capacity building related to the youth, youth compact agenda, uh, but also when it hit COVID-19 hit, we made sure that we are engaging with young people uh, and youth educators, youth workers, uh, in order to better understand the COVID-19. Uh, so this is an example of one of the webinars. The last point is the participation aspect where I'll leave it to Sarah to speak further on the participation uh, aspect. Thank you, Buthaina. I hope everyone could hear me. And Okay, I'm just gonna turn on the video. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, INE, for having us. And it's so good to hear all of these great responses all over <laughs> regarding the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, so thank you, Buthaina, for this informative introduction about the amazing work that we're doing at the, at the Zatar CAM uh, with the Youth Task Force. And under all of that that you mentioned previously, we have the promotion of youth participation. So what we do, and since the establishment 
of the youth task force, the members made sure to engage with the youth through focus group discussions and conversations to better understand their reality. However, during 2020, the youth task force strategic objective was to promote the youth participation in program planning, setup, and implementation. Both in youth and non-youth specific program responses through a structured approach. Uh, this will lead us to our current plan of creating a committee. So the youth committee will be established with an objective to scale up the youth task force commitment towards streamlining youth participation within the youth task force as a main player in designing the response towards youth programming in the camp. The youth committee will provide the youth task force with advices and recommendations on issues related to opportunities, challenges, aspirations, and any concerns from the ground towards the camp management level. Uh, this was the annual plan, as you can see. Uh, however, we were interrupted with the COVID-19 crisis and uh, during of which we have finalized the concept note and uh, the committee, the committee concept note and the final scope of it. And we are currently planning on starting the outreach process uh, that's to start uh, this month. Uh, once uh, the committee is established and we will have the candidates from the camp, uh, from Zatari camp, uh, who will help us to, to know better on ways to deal with the COVID-19 crisis and respond to the needs of youth during a which. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the Youth Task Force is also an umbrella for all of our, the many, many organizations of the camp who are currently doing and implementing great work as a response, as response to the COVID-19. So we had many great examples from different organizations such as Bluemont, NRC, and RI, which I work in, and UNICEF, of course. So uh, Bluemont's uh, learning, activities, um, learning activities during COVID-19 has been shifted towards remote uh, solutions. Uh, instructors and volunteers have been trained to begin remote classes for students and using online platforms to continue engaging youth in the camp while keeping everyone safe. Uh, also, uh, they have conducted the awareness sessions as many other organizations. As you can see, the beautiful girl there holding um, uh, a logo with the hashtag stay at home uh, to keep everyone safe uh, from COVID. Uh, also, an RC youth program continued its implementation remotely uh, through a variety of remote facilitation methodologies and the usage of WhatsApp group as a base learning platform. Around 283 youth in Zatari are able to continue their learning in vocational and ICT related courses. And finally, well, my proudest uh, moment is the, the Relief International response towards COVID, uh, against COVID-19. So Relief uh, in, uh, switched all of its modality to also uh, online education. So we switched uh, the remedial educational program to distant learning approach, uh, nearly giving 2,000 2, informal students in Zaftari and Azraq camp uh, are attending classes through WhatsApp, along with intensive follow-ups from their educators and uh, counselors. Uh, also, we switched to our recreational activities and 21st century skills uh, learning towards uh, uh, a remote and distant learning methodology. So, for example, we're giving uh, French language for around 80 students and we switched uh, the modality to online education through YouTube and WhatsApp groups. Uh, protection messages and awareness campaigns were also provided by RI through Facebook Live. And there are so many other examples, but unfortunately the time won't allow us to walk through them. Uh, we would love to hear any questions related to the youth task force after, at the end of the webinar, and we will welcome it at the Q&A. Thank you everyone and for listening and back to you, Charlotte. Thank you so much, Sarah and Vathena. Again, so, many, so much inspiring work happening. So thank you for joining us. We're gonna quickly hand over to Tiziana um, to tell us more about the work in Indonesia. And um, thank you so much, over to you. Thank you so much, Charlotte. Um, greetings to everyone from Indonesia. My name is Tisiana. I'm a Youth and Adolescent Development Specialist here with UNICEF Indonesia. And it's really wonderful to be part of the webinar. Thank you so much um, for all of you attending. Um, next slide. 
So just to give you a quick overview of COVID-19 situation, um, in all 34 provinces in Indonesia, there are confirmed cases, um, about 47,000 odd cases with th over 3,000 being among children, um, two and a half thousand deaths, 36 deaths among children. People are saying it's the highest um, death rate among children in the region. Um, and just to show you what a diverse country is, if we can go to the next slide. Um, this, this is a country of 17,000 islands, um, very, very densely populated, very large young people population. Um, there's 46 million adolescents, but if we, if we talk about young people, as referenced by Paul, 28% of the population are young people. And this is a country that is commonly referred to as a supermarket of disasters as it sits on the ring of fire. So it is a highly experienced um, country when it comes to dealing with emergencies. Go to the next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of what UNICEF has been doing um, during this, this pandemic. Um, one of the things that we've been doing in the area of education is supporting the Ministry of Education and developing guidance. So there was guidance around uh, learning from home that was launched in May. And recently we launched um, a guidance around safe reopening of schools that has been promoted um, between four ministries, education, religious affairs, health and home affairs. And this was very, very intensive work um, that we feel is very cross-sectoral in its nature. Um, we've also been conducting child-centered assessments, and I want to echo the words of my fellow panelists, keeping children and young people at the center of all of our work and especially their voices, and that's what we've been trying to do. Um, using UNICEF's Rapid Pro platform, we've been conducting assessments and looking at the effectiveness of offline learning through TV broadcasts and radio. And I think a lot of my, pan my fellow panelists have mentioned this, the, the drawbacks and, and the fact that this pandemic has shown us that actually the digital divide is far wider than we thought. Um, as, as with this, our colleague from Sierra Leone, we've also been using your report polls to understand how young people are feeling and what they're thinking um, during this pandemic to do with education, but also overall when it comes to the response um, for this pandemic. And, the results of all of this work um, informs ongoing monitoring and it informs um, the input and the advocacy that we give um, to government. So just to give you an example, a recent U report poll among 4,000 adolescents showed that almost nine out of 10 are keen and very, very excited to go back to school soon. Can we go to the next slide, please. Um, because of the diversity of the country and the fact that um, the digital gap is indeed very wide in Indonesia and many, many of the other countries, um, UNICEF has worked with the ministry to create an inventory of existing printed learning materials from UNICEF, um, local NGOs, international NGOs, other UN agencies to be made available for students at all levels, including um, adolescents that are attending community-based learning centers that are actually categorized as out-of-school adolescents. Um, and among this is a resource that I'll be speaking about later, which is the Adapted Adolescent Resource Package um, that we've been using here in Indonesia. Um, just to show you also how we're constantly trying to keep um, young people's voices in, at the center of our work, um, we recently did a survey to look at um, distance learning and how um, students across the country have been uh, learning throughout the pandemic and what we found is that um, lots of students talked about needing additional guidance from teachers, finding it very difficult to focus um, because of anxiety and because of maybe um, crowded living space or stress at home and of course the, the quality of the internet connection it varies widely across the country and that's also been a big obstacle um, for adolescents and young people um, across the country. Go to the next slide, please. Um, so as mentioned, I wanted to quickly tell you about um, a particular tool that we've been using here in Indonesia, the adolescent um, kit, that, the adapted resource package. And this is based on a kit that was developed by our adolescent um, colleagues at HQ, UNICEF HQ, that is looking at um, empowering adolescents with key skills and competencies to identify issues in their community and to find solutions and to really become active citizens. This adapted resource package is actually really, really great because it really um, contextualizes the issue of remote learning and it gives way to far more self-learning um, guidance that can be used by parents and caregivers as well. And it's maybe less of an academic. I wanna 
really reference what Bubakar said that sometimes education doesn't happen in the classroom, that actually you can learn in many different contexts. And I think this is a really good example um, of, of how we've done that. So we go to the next slide, please. Um, inside this adapted resource package, there's activity guides, there's energizer cards, which are fun activities that build on um, abilities and that really complement the activity guides that are given to the adolescents. There's inspiration cards that are also done kind of like little hobbies and activities that can motivate kids to continue learning and to continue exploring their, their creativity and, and their problem solving skills. And then there's facilitator quick guides for parents, for caregivers, or even for youth facilitators, if that, if that is the case. Um, and I think this is also a really good example of how we've tried to contextualize a lot of the development was done um, using feedback from adolescents themselves from the original kit. If we could go to the next slide, please. These are just some examples. Um, we've translated the, the kit into Bahasa Indonesia, the local language. Um, these are some of the activity cards. Let me show you the next slide, please. Inspiration and energizer cards. There's some really great activities here, including one of my favorites, which is about meditating and about stress management, which we felt very, very relevant um, during COVID. And if we could go to the next slide, um, here's, some of the different contexts that we've used um, these different resources. Um, so for example, the original adolescent kit was already integrated into the life skills education curriculum that's implemented in two provinces. Um, and what we've done is that we've worked with local newspapers and radios to help distribute to materials to kids that don't have access to the internet or to devices that um, can handle these materials. Uh, we've continuously worked through emergency affected areas. So these are areas that were affected by the tsunami and um, where they had already established what we call adolescent circles that worked with the original kit, um, sharing material again through local newspapers and for those who have access through WhatsApp. We've also um, started rolling this out with out of school children focusing on rural and remote areas um, as part of our support to community-based learning centers and um, as part of the bigger umbrella support we provide to the government um, on rolling out the national strategy on out-of-school children. Um, if we can go to the next slide. As, as many of my fellow panelists have spoken, um, it's not just about rolling out um, activities and, and programs, but it's also about um, supporting young people, empowering them to take action. And your report, as mentioned by um, Bubakar and Timbo, is one of the good examples of that. We use it for polling. We use it for sharing information. We even have a, a hoax buster chatbot that has really helped um, kids deal with, with some of the myths around this. And if we go to the next slide, um, as, as I mentioned, kids are excited to go back to school, but there is still a proportion of kids that are keen because they're, they're not keen because they're afraid of getting infected. And so this is something that obviously we take into account when it comes to the, the next part of the response. Um, if we can just skip the next, the next slide is just another example of our COVID diaries that um, is an opportunity for, for young people to share their creativity and their feelings around COVID. And this final slide, um, the next slide, please. Thank you. I'm aware that Charlotte is online and telling me to wrap up. So just two seconds. Um, uh, we, we did a lot of work around mental health because that, um, as, as is the case globally, is something that has really come up as a very, very big area to take into account among adolescents and young people. And it's something that we're really working hard um, through online support and through um, offline means as well. Um, as in terms of challenges and lessons learned, as I mentioned previously, and as my colleague Basim mentioned, the digital divide, something we really have to wrap our head around. But also even when it comes to offline um, learning, teachers and parents really need um, support in, in supporting their children through this remote, remote learning, the mental health impact, the urgent need for innovation, in learning, especially around 21st century skills, and also really understanding what it means to um, reopen schools safely and the concept of building back better. So with that, I'd like to end and uh, hand over to Charlotte for the Q&A. Thank you so much, everyone.
Thank you so much, Tiziana. So many practical examples for us there. Really appreciated. Um, and we'll come back to, if you had to skip over anything, hopefully we'll get a chance in the Q&A um, to address that. But before we open the discussion, I'm just going to hand back to Paul quickly for some, some final thoughts and reflections on the presentations we've heard. Great. Thank you, Charlotte. And thanks to all for the very interesting presentations. Um, I was fascinating to hear these different contributions from the different, uh, different contexts we're working in. And um, I can see there's lots of questions coming in as well, which is great and I'm looking forward to discussion. So I just wanted to conclude um, the, the panel session by coming back to this reflective activity that we had at the start. So I hope that you have uh, borne this in mind and you've been making links between the young people that you know and the different presentations which, were, which we've been looking at today. So I just want to share some um, initial reflections and um, some initial reflections related to these questions. So I think when we, hearing the, especially the young people presenting today, I found it very inspiring to think about the interests and the ambitions and what really came through um, from the speakers and also from Tiziana to, uh, in, the, in the recent presentation was the interest in, in learning, you know, wanting, you know, nine out of 10 wanting to go back to school or the other examples, wanting to engage, wanting to gain skills and wanting to contribute. And the ambitions from our two of our speakers, again, everyone's different in terms of the ambitions, but what really stood out for me was a desire to contribute and support others, whether in response to COVID-19 or to other, other, other aspects as well. And with the, opportunities and the barriers, um, you know, I mentioned a few barriers and the challenges of young people in humanitarian contexts in my presentation, but then it, more were mentioned even during the presentations in, in such as S, uh, sexual and gender-based violence, mental health, or MHPS, and psychosocial support, MHPSS, um, and um, also the disruption to learning, um, even when we try to address it through these different uh, modalities. But I think we've also seen many opportunities um, in the presentations in terms of education and different modalities, whether it's the resource pack that was shared for Indonesia, the uh, youth task force shared uh, many examples around adapting education through um, creating WhatsApp groups, um, uh, online messages, and then uh, Reflect, shared by Timbo, was also a very interesting um, approach to, to learning. But I just want to think about this last question around how has COVID-19 impacted on opportunities for young people? And I think um, we can reflect on, yes, there's many challenges, but how do we turn those challenges into opportunities? And I think we, you know, all of us are experiencing new ways of working. So how can we think about um, how will we adapt learning, but also how do we adapt engaging with young people? And I think one approach um, which we should bear in mind is the approach of positive youth development, putting young people at the center and working with them with their assets and capacities for their own learning, but also to contribute to others as well. And I kind of want to end the reflection just coming back to something that uh, Bubakar said, which really struck with me, which was that he's learned more through volunteering than in the classroom. And I mean, for us as a global network of the interagency network of education in emergencies, it makes me think, well, what does the E for education stand for? I think it's beyond the sort of classroom based or, or uh, different modalities of even remote learning, but can we integrate you know, youth engagement and supporting youth to volunteer within that broader, broader conception of what it means to, um, to participate in education? So I'm going to stop there. Just some initial reflections from me, but I look forward to hearing about uh, hearing the questions and the responses from the panelists. Fabulous. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, Alana, if we could stop sharing the slides and if I could ask all our speakers to turn their videos on, we'll, we'll address some of these questions. There are many fantastic questions. We may not have time to cover them all. If we don't, apologies. Um, we'll do an FAQ document afterwards with, with some written answers as well. But thank you for sharing these questions. I'll also ask um, two other colleagues who have been integral to the planning of this webinar um, to join us as well. So Sophia and Priya, if you also want to, to put 
put your um, videos on and, and jump in with any um, answers um, if you'd like to. Um, and huge thanks again for everything you've done to plan for today. We've, as I say, we've had many, many questions um, and, and Paul, you, you draw on some of these key themes there. Um, and so the first question I'd like to ask has come from Sandrine. Sandrine, thank you for sharing this important question. Um, today saw the launch of the, the Global Education Monitoring Report on Inclusion. And really, you know, this important um, tagline that they have of all means all. And so a question from um, Sandrine and other panelists is, but how do you take into consideration this intersectionality of vulnerabilities of being adolescents or youth and having a disability? And really just asking for any of the panelists to share any experiences of tools of, of working on inclusive education. Um, so I'll just open that up. Please do jump in panelists if, with any, any reflections. I'll be happy to share a few thoughts. Thanks, Paul, please. Great. I mean, it's a really uh, critical question working with uh, youth with disabilities. And I feel in the various agencies and coordination groups that I've worked in, this is consistently highlighted. So it's really great that this question is, is coming up here. And I think um, from my, I'll give an example of when we conducted a, um, an assessment for youth in Zatu and Azra camps in Jordan a few years ago. And uh, in Azra camp, we were specifically, you know, in each camp, we were looking to specifically understand the needs of youth with disabilities, as well as others. And despite working with, with, uh, with specialized agencies, we, we found it very challenging even to meet with young people with disabilities in order to understand what their needs are. So if you can't organize a focus group discussion, then it's very hard to engage them in, 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 in programs itself. So that really goes to show that this is something that's challenging and really does require additional focus. So I think a first step is evidence and assessment. So understanding who are these young people and how can we, uh, how can we engage with them just to understand what are their needs, different types of disabilities, and also to emphasize, I'm pleased the term intersectionality was used, you know, intersectionality of, of age and adolescent versus an older youth, um, how that relates with the disability, what type of disability, gender, of course, displacement status, uh, many other examples. So I think as a first step, building up that evidence base. And then, um, I mean, a, a second point before I hand over is just, yes, we need to adapt programming to respond to the needs of young people, but we also need to work with their parents or other community members to really build an enabling environment where there's a community belief that these young people with disabilities who are often quite marginalized uh, should have access to the services that are provided as well. So we can certainly think about what would be relevant tools and resources to share after the webinar, but I'm I'm sure other colleagues have some ideas as well. Thanks, Paul. Would anyone else like to, to jump in and add to that response? Um, I'd just I, like I, to add, Charlotte. But Dana, you go first and then we'll hand over I to I actually Tissima. wanted to build on Paul's point because he mentioned also the Zachary. Within the structure also we have the Agent Disability Task Force who are not necessarily focusing on young people but also taking into consideration the engagement and the advocacy for Young, uh, for people with disability. So we keep the conversation at least at the coordination level to ensure that uh, we have an understanding for young people with disability, but I second what Paul mentioned in terms of really hard uh, uh, engagement uh, of young people with disability. The other thing, uh, uh, ref uh, reflecting on Sarah's uh, mentioned the committee, one of the criteria we emphasize that we need to really look hard and make a youth committee that represents the diversity uh, of young people in the camp. So young people with disability is one of them. And we hope that this will help us more to inform our uh, knowledge about the situation of young people at the camp level. Great, thanks so much, Bethane. Over to you, Tiziana. Last reflection. Hi, thank you so much. Yes, also like to build on what, um, what Paul was talking about in terms of an evidence base. We've done a very small assessment of uh, children and adolescents with disabilities, but because of the difficulties that Paul mentioned, we've only been able to do it through an existing inclusive education program. So this is already a very small group of, um, of young people that are already in schooling or in a program, so maybe slightly less marginalized. But one of the strong things that came up is really a plea to not lump 
quote unquote disabilities together and to really look at the, the fact that it's not a homogenous group and that the needs are different and that they need to be at the center of solutions for them as much as, as young people in general are not a homogenous group. And one of the key examples that um, one of the young people gave us is whenever people talk about disabilities, immediately there's offers for sign language interpreters and not all of us need a sign language interpreter. And I think that's really, that really hit home for us to have a stronger evidence base and to really understand the needs. And in order to do so, we have to find a way to reach them and we have to find a way to listen to them in a way that's comfortable for them. Thank you, Tissiana, really important um, points there. Thank you all. I'm going to move to the next question now in the interest of time. Um, but if, yeah, if we have further um, responses and resources to share, we will do so afterwards. The next question um, is one for you, Babakar and Timbo, from your experiences. Um, so the questioner, um, Nilofa, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, asks, during the pandemic, how are you reaching youth in con um, Sorry, next question. Thivia, I'm sorry, Thivia, your question. How can young people be motivated? So a real question around motivation to continue education, to be engaged in um, their own development. Given that services are so limited, there are these complexities at the moment with the pandemic. How can we really encourage motivation of young people in their education? Um, so Timbo, Bubakar, any reflections around motivation? Yes, so <clears throat> like I said, for restless development and for our work, especially engaging young people in this um, COVID-19 situation or the um, Ebola outbreak that we had before this time. Uh, motivation about young people is all about you prioritizing them. You give them the necessary opportunities that are there actually to take the lead. And we actually, um, for first of all, the recruitment process that we are advertising, we, we, we actually indicate in the recruitment process that um, young people are highly encouraged to apply. So that's one key motivation first from our own side, because if you really want to work for restless development or to take the lead in responding to emergency issues, so their priorities are concerned by, first of all, in the recruitment process, that young people are highly encouraged to apply. So that alone first is a motivation for them. And when they come actually for the training after the volunteering process, we give them a certificate and this certificate is a kind of a certificate which they will use to get job and we have um, we've experienced so many young people have got job based on the certificate that we are giving them after their volunteering process so it's also a kind of a motivation and then when they are going to do um, the sensitization in those community we give them a kind of um, small logistics it's not a kind of a salary but actually to motivate them to go to those community and give um, their, their support, give their energy, give their, their whatever they have, their skills to those community to engage other young people in those community. So that's basically our support we will be providing to young people. Great. Thank you, Timbo. Some really practical examples there. Bubakar, anything you would add and how we can motivate and engage young people with education at these times? I, uh, yeah, so um, basically talking from a very low resource country, I think it all has to start one with passion, you know, engaging in, your, in the area of your interests, thereby you would have self-motivation to ensure that whatever you do is not motivated by any um, means of financial gain or so, but um, you're doing this out of your own courtesy to support the vulnerable population. But of course, it's also important that um, there, there, there is a lot of investment in terms of um, capacity building for, for these young people because these are the capacities that these young people would use to ensure that they, they, they you know, sort of like guide their career path to become, you know, you know um, full professionals. When they become professionals, it becomes easier for them already. They have the necessary skills and capacities to ensure that they are they're, they're, you know, able to do their work more meaningfully. So. For, from, for us, from my end, I think this is it. And then from UNMGCY level, we have this principle of non-discrimination. We believe thereby we're creating that safe space for every young person to be able to engage with us and then, you know, try to contribute their quota towards um, every development process that we're involved in. Thank you. Great. 
Thank you so much. Uh, these words around passion and power and energy are really um, coming out really strongly today. Um, Sarah, I could see you nodding along. Did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, well, uh, during my work, we found, especially in the, in the crisis, we need a lot of motivation to, to keep the students um, interested in learning, especially in formal education and recreational activities. So what we found out, the involvement of parents are essential. Um, so we usually have a PTA meeting, a very, any very intensive follow-ups with the parents. Uh, we usually, as Timbo mentioned, we, we also give them certificates. And uh, what one of our colleagues suggested earlier, um, an amazing idea that we should nominate one of the youth as a leader to lead the other group. And we have like small leaders within the each WhatsApp group who will uh, help us as facilitators in the implementation and also motivate the students. So it's like a chain of motivation that should start, as uh, Bubakar mentioned, with passion and then lead on later on. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Wonderful answers. I'm feeling, again, very inspired. Um, I'm conscious of time and we do have a couple more really important questions. Um, one is really around, and this was Neela Farr's question that I, I started before, but during the pandemic, how are we reaching youth in context with low connectivity? I think at the moment we're all very conscious that on online solutions are often what are being offered, um, but how can we reach those who don't have smartphones, radio, television and so on? Um, and I'll open that up to everyone. Any, any reflections? Yes, um, to be honest, it's actually difficult to reach out to people that don't have access to radio, to television in um, remote communities. It, it's that the challenge is actually there yeah, because we have remote communities also. We, we have young people in those communities. We have adolescent girls. They actually want to get access to um, the online learning program. It's actually um, difficult. But um, the good thing is, if we also say that we, the government or organization don't want to engage other young people that have that opportunity, you know, it's something that um, will also serve as a challenge for every other young people or adolescent in the country. But um, what um, the government and other organizations have done actually to reduce some of um, these um, challenges is um, by engaging the teachers in those remote community and give them the schedule of the online learning program. So when once they know the schedule of the online learning program, they now inform the general community that on these dates, there will be an English session, right? Which it will be happening on the radio program. So that kind of sensitization is ongoing at community um, level for formal education. But for like informal uh, education for us in Sierra Leone, whilst we are doing the functional literacy and numeracy for out of school adolescent girls, um, you know the, the safety measure for COVID-19 is social distancing, where you don't want to bring people together. So, and we don't want also um, our facilitator to actually stand in front of the adolescent girls and talk, something like that. So we have, um, we have 120 community for restless development and these odd projects we are implementing it with other three partners, IRC and CONCERN. They also have their communities and their district they are working in. So we actually have a Bluetooth speaker wherein we do a recording in bigger towns and we go with the Bluetooth, with the, with the memory card or memory stick, we insert the Bluetooth speaker and we call a small group of seven to 10 girls, they sit and they listen to the teaching, to the session that is um, going on until they actually find a ways on how we can, um, we can practically deliver in the session to the adolescent girls. Of course, we are currently at, um, trying to design the adaptation plan on our learning program. So basically that's, that's what is a challenge actually to have a kind of online to some of these communities. But these yeah. are some of the things we are actually using to reach out to them. 
Yeah, thank you, Timbo. Yeah, no, it's definitely a challenge. We're definitely hearing that from our members. Um, and maybe if others have other examples to share, we could share them with the recording after the webinar. I am conscious that we are running out of time. It's been much too short. We could spend much, uh, much longer together. We have had some really important questions around the mental health needs of youth and also around gender implications. I think we can definitely make sure to follow up with our brilliant panellists um, to respond to those questions. I just wanted, um, Basim, if you're still there, um, I, we had a, a few questions around building back better I'm conscious that's not something you mentioned and just any quickly any final reflections of what you'd like to see if as people talk about building back better what does that mean for young people any thoughts thank you thank you so much Charlotte and, and this is a really important question so that so you can answer that questions on on many levels there's sort of the technical level and the aspirational level so in terms of the the technical level we have some on the link i think there's some 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 of the the, the guidances of unicef in terms of of building up better but i'd like to address sort of more the 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 the, the, the conceptual aspect of building up uh, better uh that addresses a lot of what we have spoken about seeing the COVID as an opportunity and i think this is really something that despite all the challenges and with the online distant modalities, the equity issues, we are seeing actually much more concerted effort from education and learn, uh, learning leaders to really start um, uh, preparing themselves for a new reality of, of learning and education that actually looks at distant lear learning modalities, that looks at online learning, that looks at intersectoral approaches, that looks at uh, meaningful engagement of youth. And we are seeing actually much more engaged effort of collaboration between education leaders, education agencies, and within ministries themselves and countries towards, towards things that we've been advocating uh, for, for, such, for such a long time. So the reopening uh, better is a, is a very much of a, of a imaginary construct of how we want to advocate for education. I think the, what makes it sort of an opportune and urgent right now is this is actually really rallying all efforts and, and attention in terms of both technical, financial, and uh, uh, resources. Um, we can spend a whole two day webinar on this, but I hope this is a sufficient answer for now. No, it's perfect. Lots of food for thought, I think, as we move forward and, and continue to collaborate together. I, am, I can't apologise enough that we don't have longer um, to talk about these issues. We will share the recording and we will um, respond more fully in writing to the brilliant questions of us today. I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank all of you, the panellists, um, for such wonderful presentation um, and all the preparation that went into that. And also Priya and Sophia as well for all of the work you've done to, to organise everything for today. I hope we can keep these conversations going thank you um, for all our participants um, and um, yeah we really appreciate everything you're doing we'll be in touch um, but thank you everyone stay safe best wishes thank you bye bye Charlotte thank you for everyone bye talking. thank you thanks everyone thank you thank you Pia <laughs> thanks Timbo lovely hearing you you guys were great <laughs> thanks, Pia. thanks 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 Bubakar Pia. thanks Sara you all were thanks, excellent everyone. thank you thanks everyone bye Bye-bye. Hi, then.